This is apparently the all new Suzuki Swift, except I'm not sure that's completely true. In this video, I'm gonna be telling you why that is and also finding out if the new Swift is the spiritual successor to the Ford Fiesta, which was very sadly killed off last year. So stay with us here in Bordeaux and don't forget to subscribe for lots more new car reviews, reveals and road trips. Now the Swift is a small hatchback that's been around since the 1980s, although Suzuki officially considers the first generation car the model that went on sale in 2004. And that's because it was the first time the nameplate was used in Japan. That makes this the fourth generation car, and it's a little bit bigger than a Toyota Igo Cross, but not as big as a Yaris. And that means it is smaller than a lot of modern European super minis like the Renault Clio and the Skoda Fabia. And actually it's the size of the Swift that's interesting because it is to the millimeter exactly the same height and width as the old third generation car. And that is quite a coincidence because if it were all new, you would expect there to be some changes to those dimensions, even if only small ones. Well, it turns out this is built on the same Hartec platform as the old third generation Swift. And that platform traces its way back almost a decade to cars like the Suzuki Baleno that you can't buy anymore. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. Lots of heavily updated cars use the same platforms as their predecessors. It's just that calling it all new is a bit of a stretch. And actually, it doesn't look dramatically different from the old Swift either. You've still got the same shaped headlights, broadly speaking, the same shaped grille as well. Although there is now a higher shoulder line, and that's designed to help the car look a little bit taller, a little bit bigger. There is also what's probably best described as a mono prow around here. And that's because the shot line for the bonnet is bigger than it was before. The bonnet itself is also flatter and it doesn't extend as far down on the nose of the car. If you're a fan of this particular color, it's called Frontier Blue Metallic. Suzuki is very proud of it, it's all new and it's a three layer paint system. And that's designed to give a deeper sheen. But if you don't like it, don't worry. There are seven other colors to choose from plus a further four dual color paints. And they basically have a black or metallic gray roof depending on the main body color you go for. There is lots of genuinely new stuff though, including what's under here. So this is Suzuki's new three cylinder 1.2 liter petrol engine. It isn't turbocharged, so it only has 81 brake horsepower. And although Suzuki calls it a mild hybrid, I'd actually say it's more of a mild, mild hybrid because there is no 48 volt electrical system like you'll find in most other mild hybrids. Instead, there's a 12 volt battery and that powers what's effectively a big starter motor to assist the petrol engine when you're pulling away. And then when you're slowing down, that motor acts as a generator to produce electricity to feed back into the battery. Officially, the new Swift delivers up to 8% better fuel efficiency than the old K12D four-cylinder engine that was in the old Swift. And that means CO2 emissions out of there are as low as 99 grams per kilometer and fuel economy as good as 64 mpg. Now, those are some really impressive figures, especially for a mild, mild hybrid. And of course, that's partly because of how efficient the new engine is, but it's also because of how light the Swift is. So depending on which version you go for, the curb weight can be as low as 949 kilos. That is way lighter than a Clio, a Fabia or a Polo. And it also helps make up for the Swift's relative lack of power. Something we'll be talking about a little bit more later on. For the very best efficiency, you'll need to go for the standard five-speed manual gearbox. Although if you don't want to change gear for yourself, there is also a CVT automatic option. That adds 1,250 pounds to the price and worsens fuel economy by about 8%. And very unusually for a small car like this, there is a four wheel drive option. It's called All Grip. This is one of those cars. And as well as obviously having better traction than the regular two wheel drive model, it also has jacked up suspension. So you get a little bit more ground clearance. The All Grip won't be arriving in the UK until later this year and fuel economy and CO2 emissions haven't been announced yet. But we do know it'll cost an extra 1250 pounds over an equivalent two wheel drive version. And you'll only be able to have it with the five-speed manual gearbox. As I've already said, the Swift is smaller than a lot of its rivals. So how does it stack up for practicality? Well, when it comes to boot space, there is more space for luggage in here than there is in an Igo Cross, but less of course than in a Clio or a Fabia. There's also a pretty big drop down from the boot entrance onto the floor and you can't have a high adjustable boot floor to mitigate that. On the other hand, there's still a reasonable amount of space in there. A weekly shop will be absolutely fine or luggage for a weekend away. Or if you take out the partial shelf and fold down the rear seats, you can in fact fit a wine barrel 
into the back, which is pretty handy if you want to bring some wine back from your family holiday. Although clearly not if you live in Brexit Britain because you'd have to pay a huge amount of import charge on that. Anyway, let's take a look in the back. Well, on the plus side, these rear doors, they open quite wide, so access is good. And you've also got quite tall side windows and they help it feel not too claustrophobic back here. There is also more space than you'll find in, say, an Igo Cross, but clearly this isn't one of the biggest cars in this class. So I'm just over six foot. This seat on this side is set up from a driving position. This passenger seat is in the same position and not a lot of spare legroom at all. And headroom isn't brilliant either because if I sit right back in my seat, rather than hitting the headrest, my head actually just hits the roof lining. So clearly there are more practical cars in this class when it comes to carrying rear passengers. The Skoda Fabia is one, the Polo is another, and even the cheaper Dacia Sandero is quite a bit bigger in the back than this. But if you only plan to carry adults in the back occasionally, or you just plan to put kids back here, then this will be absolutely fine. So really, it just depends on your needs. So what about the front? Well, let's start with the driving position because unlike some cars in this class, and I'm talking about the Igo Cross or certain versions of the Dacia Sandero, you get steering wheel reach and height adjustment. On some budget cars in this class, you only get height adjustment. So that is a good thing. And it allows you to get pretty comfortable behind the wheel. The only small complaint I'd have is that in an ideal world, I would prefer it if the driver's seat went down a little bit lower because if I have the steering wheel where I want it, I just lose the top of those instrument dials. Not a huge problem, but in an ideal world, as I say, I'd prefer the driver's seat to go down a little bit lower. The seat itself though, is actually very supportive. There's no adjustable lumbar support or anything like that, but you get a good amount of lower back support as standard, and you've got nice big side bolsters, and they are just quite comfortable and provide you with decent amount of support when you're going around corners. Now, if you go for range topping ultra trim, you get automatic air conditioning. This car has that, and you've got some toggle switches here for adjusting the interior temperature. We prefer dials, but certainly this is much better than having all of those controls in the touchscreen infotainment system. If you go for entry level motion, we'll talk about the different trim levels a little bit more later on, then you get manual air conditioning. So really it's not that much of a loss. All versions do however though, get this nine inch touchscreen infotainment system. So it isn't one of the best systems out there. The graphics aren't brilliant and also it takes quite a while sometimes between you pressing the screen and anything actually happening. And also the operating system is a little bit clunky. It takes a while to get your head around. But on the plus side, it's quite high up, so it's easy to see. You don't have to look down on the dashboard too far when you're driving along, so it's not that distracting. And you do get Apple CarPlay and Android Auto as standard, whichever version you go for. Also quite a lot of storage in here. So you've got a couple of cup holders down here, a small tray just in front of it for your keys or your phone, another small, quite shallow tray just behind the gear lever here. And also the door pockets, although they're quite slim, they are long, so you can fit a couple of bottles of water down there, or as I've used it for, a notepad. Interior quality though, that's a bit mixed. So on the plus side, you do get quite a few different colors in here and different textures. So as you can see, you've got this cream lower half of the dashboard, gray upper half, and that makes it look a little bit more interesting than it would in a car that just has a completely gray dashboard. But it is all hard and scratchy plastic, so there's no soft touch materials in here like you'll find in some more expensive small cars like the Renault Clio, like the VW Polo. But certainly it is nicer in here than it is in the Sandero or even an Igo Cross. And another thing that's really impressive is the view out. So you've got, again, just as in the back, quite tall windows here, lots of glass, and these upright pillars as well. They make it really easy to see out of junctions and roundabouts. So overall, in the front, pretty good. Okay, so we've covered a lot of the new technical things about this car, but what's it actually like to drive? Well, let's start with the engine, because as I mentioned earlier, that is all new. And on the whole, it's pretty impressive. Unlike a lot of three-cylinder engines, it's fairly smooth. You don't get much in the way of vibration filtering up through the pedals, up through the steering wheel, and certainly a lot less than you would in, say, an Igo Cross. This engine is also a lot stronger than the one in that car from Low Revs 2. It's not turbocharged, so of course there are much, much faster cars in this class, but it's not completely gutless. The performance is fine, really, so you don't need to rev it that hard. And even if you do, it actually sounds quite nice, particularly for a three-cylinder engine. 
Other impressive things are this five-speed manual gearbox. It's nice to use, it's quite well defined. The clutch action as well is quite positive. And the handling is also pretty impressive. There isn't too much body roll through corners. That's something Suzuki's worked hard on with this new generation of car to reduce the amount of lean compared with European rivals when you're cornering. And of course, as I said earlier, this is a light car. So it's reasonably agile and you get a decent sense of connection with the front wheels from the steering. Less impressive though is the ride because the suspension is quite stiff and quite often when we are driving cars abroad in Europe, it's difficult to get a sense of how the car might translate to UK roads because the roads are so smooth. But actually out here in Bordeaux, they're not that great. So I can tell you with a fair amount of confidence that this will not translate that well to the UK. This is not gonna be as comfortable as many small cars. If this were the hot Swift Sport, a model that we expect to come potentially next year, then that would be absolutely fine, but it isn't. And I do think that a lot of buyers will expect a slightly more comfortable, more supple ride than they'll get from this car. It isn't the quietest small car either. So Suzuki says it's fitted more sound editing material in the new Swift than it did in the old one, which I'm sure is true. But the reality is there's still quite a lot of road noise filtering up into the interior, particularly when you're driving along coarse surfaces. The new Swift is offered in just two trim levels, Motion or Ultra. Motion comes with everything most people are gonna really want in a small, relatively budget-focused car, including 16-inch alloys, LED headlights, and the infotainment system we talked about earlier. Plus, you even get adaptive cruise control, keyless entry, heated front seats, a reversing camera, and blind spot monitoring. The Ultra adds a polished finish to the alloys, along with automatic air conditioning and electric folding mirrors, but we'd save the money, especially given that the Swift isn't as cheap as you might be hoping. Prices start at £18,699, so up around £1,500 compared with the outgoing Swift. And yes, as I've said, you do get lots of standard equipment, but you can have a Renault Clio for 17,800 pounds, the Igo X starts at around 16,000, and the Sandero at less than 14K. So if you're paying cash, we'd say there are better ways to spend your money. However, the Swift looks much more tempting if you're buying on finance, thanks to relatively slow predicted depreciation and a 0% APR offer until at least June, it offers cheaper monthly repayments than most of its rivals. But for lots more information about the new Swift, head over to our website, whatcar.com, where you'll find our detailed written review. We hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, please do give it a like and leave us a comment below if you'd like to know anything else about the new Swift. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.